Welcome back. In this third and final video of our discussion of direct products, we're going to take a look at the groups U of N and try to decide what they look like. Now you'll remember that U of N was defined as the set of all integers that were positive and less than N, but that were relatively prime to N. For U of 100, we get these 40 numbers. You'll see that none of them has a factor greater than one in common with 100. Now, can we say anything about this group? I can list the elements, but that doesn't necessarily tell me anything about the structure of the, the group, what the Cayley table might look like. What can we say in general for, uh, for this group or for U of N? Well, one thing we might wonder about comes from the previous video. There we looked at all the finite abelian groups we could see in the table, and we noticed that each was either cyclic or a direct product of cyclic groups. Now u of 100 is finite and abelian, as is each group u of n. Is it true that these groups will be direct products of cyclic groups? Well, to answer this question, we're going to take a look at two big theorems for taking u of n and breaking it into more manageable pieces. We'll see how this applies to u of 100. Here's the first of those theorems. Suppose that the integer m can be factored as m equals n1 times n2 times dot 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 times nk, where each of the factors ni is relatively prime to all of the others. So I could take any two distinct of these factors, and I'll know that they don't have anything larger than 1 as a common factor. Well, in that situation, the group u of m is isomorphic to u of n1 direct product u of n2 direct product dot 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 direct product u of nk. Now we've taken the group of units and broken it down into smaller groups of units based on the factorization of the number. How would we prove this? Well, we'll omit the full details here, but a basic idea is this. We'll handle the number of groups in our direct product by induction. We'll start by just looking at the external direct product of two groups. For that situation, we'll define an isomorphism from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. We'll call that isomorphism phi, mapping u of s t to u of s direct product u of t. And what we'll do is we'll take elements of u of s t and we'll mod them out by s and by t to get the entries from u of s and u of t. Now this is clearly a map to the external direct product, but it is an, is it an isomorphism? Well, that's something you'll have to verify, but it can be done if s and t are relatively prime. Now, what would that mean for us? Well, we'll see what that means for u of 100 in a, in a bit. The second theorem we'll talk about deals with the groups of units for specific uh, situations. This theorem is due to Gauss in 1801. He showed that the group of units of two, um, so in other words, u of two, is isomorphic to the trivial group, u of 4 is isomorphic to z2, u of a power of 2, where that power is at least 3, is going to be congruent or isomorphic to z sub 2 raised to the power minus 2, direct product z2. And if we take u of p raised to the n, that will be isomorphic to z sub p to the n minus p to the n minus 1 assuming that p is an odd prime and n is a positive integer. Now, if you're interested, you might think about how you might prove this. Um, see if you can reconstruct Gauss's argument. But one thing you'll notice right away is that the orders are correct. There is exactly one number less than 2 that's relatively prime to it, two numbers less than 4 that are relatively prime to that, and there are 2 to the n minus 1 elements less than than 2 to the n that are relatively prime to it, and p to the n minus p to the n minus 1 numbers less than p to the n that are relatively prime to it. So the orders are correct. Now, with this theorem and the one on the previous uh, slide, we can show that every group, u of n, is isomorphic to the external direct product of cyclic groups. How do we do that? Well, the theorem on the previous slide said that if you can break n down into a uh, product of powers of primes, then the group u of n would be isomorphic to an external direct product of u of each of those factors. 
Gauss's theorem on this screen tells us how to handle u of a prime power. So if we were to take Gauss's base cases and we put them into the first big theorem, we'll get the result stated here. Now, to illustrate that, let's take a look at our question. What does the group u of 100 look like? What can we say about that group? Well, as we mentioned, u of 100 will be isomorphic to u of 4, direct product u of 25, because these factors multiply to 100, and they are relatively primed to each other. Taking a look at this expression now, we'll use what we see above. In place of u of 4, we'll substitute z2, because they're isomorphic. And in place of u of 25, which is equal to 5 squared, we'll take z sub 25 minus 5 to get z20. Now this is interesting. We're able to see again that uh, this group does have 40 elements. And writing u of 100 in this way, we're able to tell exactly what the elements' uh, orders should be. We can answer lots of other interesting questions about u of 100 a little bit more easily because we know how to factor that as an external direct product of other cyclic groups. Well, to wrap up our discussion of, cyclic, of, of direct products in these videos, we'll just remind you that external direct products of groups give us both, one, a new way to build groups from others, and two, a way of breaking down known groups in useful ways. In a direct product, it is easy to answer questions about things like element orders, and it's often easier, maybe in ways we haven't seen yet in the course, to talk about subgroups or maps like isomorphisms and so on. We now have a few conjectures, uh, particularly about groups of order p squared and about all finite abelian groups that we can now say we have the vocabulary for now that we know how uh, what external direct products are. Well, let's see what's ahead.